There we go. Okay. So when it comes to products that are available through the channel, which is uh, for people like you, um, we have security appliances, UTM, um, advanced threat management firewalling or uh, sandboxing appliances, all sorts of different security appliances, wireless LAN products, which is uh, where my focus mostly is, um, computer network switches, hospitality gateways. So these would be like firewall devices specifically designed to be used in a hotel, ca cafe, or any other place where you're providing guest access, and a number of different pieces of software to provide network management. So we'll talk briefly here about Nebula. Most of you have probably sent through a much longer presentation on this in the past. So Nebula is our cloud managed networking solution. Um, for those of you that don't understand what that means, um, if you've heard of Meraki, it's same sort of idea behind Meraki, uh, only without all the great expense behind it. So some of the benefits of moving your network into the cloud is you can get things up and running in literally just minutes. Um, most settings are automatically configured uh, in the cloud and automatically pushed out to the device once it gets powered on and connected. There's no additional hardware or software required, so no cloud keys, no wireless LAN controllers, um, nothing like that. Plug in the device, go to your web browser, connect to the cloud, and you'll be able to see your new site and all your existing sites. Um, we give you a nice snapshot. You're able to check in on all of your customers, see what's going on on their networks, and easily and quickly jump between your different customers if there's any sort of maintenance, monitoring, or reporting that you need to keep an eye on. So everything is right there in one spot. It was designed from the ground up to make it easy to manage and monitor multiple customers. So some highlights here, there are no mandatory license or subscriptions. This is a big difference between say Meraki where you must purchase a license every year. And if you fail to purchase that license, you essentially get locked out of your hardware. We don't do that. We do offer a premium version of Nebula, which offers some more features specifically aimed at the MSP market, which probably doesn't interest most of you. Um, but if for some reason that license expires, it simply rolls back to the free version, which takes us to Nebula is free for lifetime at the core or basics of Nebula, provides management of an unlimited number of customers and an unlimited number of devices. Um, it's not like some of the other cheaper and expensive cloud services where they uh, give you a couple devices for free, or they give you a couple customers for free, and then you gotta start paying. Nope, free version of Nebula, unlimited number of devices, unlimited number of customers. You will never be locked out of your hardware. And in fact, most of the Nebula hardware these days is what we call Nebula Flex that allows you to use it um, either managed in the cloud or managed more traditionally. And you can switch between modes at will. So you can always switch out of Nebula and use it as a standalone piece of hardware. So that's our quick summary of Nebula. Um, I wanna talk about what's new here with switches. So um, the first line of these rolled out and I wanna say July and the rest of them just came out last month. These were switches that were designed for IP camera surveillance. Um, we're going, Sean, we're a bunch of guys who do VoIP stuff. Why are we talking about this? Because there are some cool features in these switches that even that'll be even beneficial even if you're not doing cameras and you're simply doing VoIP or other network services that use PoE. So one of the first things on there is we offer extended range. We provide ethernet and PoE um, for a range of up to 250 meters. Traditional PoE and Ethernet is only 100 meters, and this works with any vendor's equipment. So you don't have to buy a proprietary piece of equipment on the other end, such as a proprietary phone system. It'll work with whatever phone systems you currently use and like. Um, it does drop the speed from 100 megabits down to 10 megabits, which should be perfectly fine for doing VoIP. Um, continuous PoE, if you used a lot of other PoE switches. One of the things that happens is if you need to change the configuration, often they have to reboot the switch, or if you need to do a firmware update, and when it gets done, it has to reboot the switch, and during that time, PoE gets turned off. So one of the things these new series of switches does is it keeps the PoE going, even if the switch itself is going offline to apply a configuration, reboot, et cetera, et cetera. So the connected devices should never lose their PoE power. 
Um, we've got a nice device status screen in the device. Um, so you can log in, see all of your phones, whether they are online or not, um, what speed their connection is, how much PoE power they are drawing. You can see, even see the name for the device, the IP address. And you can use this screen here to power cycle one of the devices should you need to reboot it for some reason. We've also got a cool auto recovery mode. So we've got a couple different ways of doing this. We can monitor each individual connected device, either using LLDP or using a ping. Um, and if it sees that the device becomes non-responsive and you can define you know, what counts as non-responsive, one ping drop, two ping drops, et cetera. Um, we have the option to either make a note in the log that the device went offline, or we can automatically reboot the device for you. Um, we've got a number of settings here to say how long we should wait once we reboot the device before we resume pinging again to give it the proper amount of time for it to reboot back up and get connected back onto the network. And then these switches here are designed to be even more heavy duty than our typical switches. Um, specifically, um, we've doubled the electrostatic discharge protection. So that's like if you've ever um, reached out and touched the doorknob and you get a little shock there, that's electric static discharge. You don't want that going into your switch. So we've increased the protection there. We've also given you four times stronger surge protection. So that's, uh, you know, power surge is coming in through the AC power. So we've done both of those for you there to help make sure this device lasts a long time. We've also increased the temperature range that these devices are able to handle so they can handle much warmer temperatures. So this makes it ideal if you're putting things, you know, your customer doesn't have a dedicated proper wiring closet that's climate controlled. So you're putting this in some dusty little closet or out of the way nook and cranny. No worries, these will continue to operate and work um, just fine in those tough environments. Um, and for some reason, should they not, they've got a lifetime warranty. So we've got two series of switches. The 1300s are unmanaged. The 1350s have a web GUI for managing them. Um, I'm not gonna go through too much of the differences here on them, but I do want to go ahead and call out the uh, GS1350-6HP. This is our first switch that supports the new 802.3BT. POE standard. So this is a new POE standard that can put out 60 watts of power on a single port. Traditionally, originally, um, POE was limited to 15.4 watts. There was the AT standard, which has been um, pretty standard for pretty much everything these days, which is up to 30 watts, and now the BT standard, which does up to 60 watts. So that 1350-6HP is our first switch that supports it. You're mostly going to see demand for this for the new 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 access points. Um, or if you're doing cameras that have pan, tilt, zoom on them, some of those require a lot of power, especially if they're 8K cameras. So that is it for our switch. So now we're gonna start talking about Wi-Fi 6. What is it? Why should you be interested in it? You're probably seeing a lot of about it right now. And if you haven't yet, you're going to start seeing tons and tons of marketing revolving around this. And it is something if you're doing a lot of VoIP and you're doing VoIP over Wi-Fi, you should really pay attention to. It solves a number of the problems um, that people have using voice over Wi-Fi. So we'll talk a little bit just about voice over IP. As I'm sure many of you guys know, it doesn't require a lot of bandwidth, yet it can be really finicky when it comes to voice quality and making your end users happy. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is really simple. You're doing real-time communication with each other. Unlike a Netflix stream or a YouTube stream or something like that, you, you can't solve a lot of the issues of drop packets and things like that by buffering. Because when you're talking to someone, you can't wait for those packets to come in. If they get dropped, you can't deal with stuff coming in, you know, in the wrong order. Otherwise, people get really frustrated really quick. I didn't realize we had animation here, my bad. Just illustrating what I was talking about. So Wi-Fi compounds this and makes it even tougher than if you're doing wired VoIP um, for a couple different reasons. One, when we're talking traditional Wi-Fi, even 802.11 um, AC stuff, only one device is allowed to transmit at a time. 
the access point and the client are using the same frequency to broadcast. So they each have to take turns. And as you add more and more clients, all of those clients and access points all have to take turns broadcasting. So you really quickly run into a situation where the, you start, you get multiple devices trying to broadcast and talk at the same time. They start interfering with each other, packets start getting dropped. In addition, you're using either the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz spectrum, and that's being shared with other access points, including those of your neighbors, cordless phones, Bluetooth, microwaves, game console controllers, just about anything you can think of that is wireless in some means is using that 2.4 or 5 gigahertz spectrum. So that all has to take turns sharing that space with your access points and with your client devices that are doing VoIP. So the net result of that is you tend to get a lot of drop packets, a lot of retransmits, which means either voice quality is being dropped or being garbled as it's being sent. So Wi-Fi 6 is, is what we're pitching here as being the solution, and I really think this legitimately is going to make a huge difference when it comes to voice over Wi-Fi quality. Um, so Wi-Fi 6 is the term being used to describe the new 802.11ax standard. Um, if you look at some older marketing materials, you may see it called high efficiency Wi-Fi. Um, it solves a number of issues when it comes to Wi-Fi. Um, it's essentially a complete rewriting of how Wi-Fi works, specifically to optimize things and make things uh, more responsive to today's modern usage of a network rather than how networks were used back in the 90s when 802.11 first came around. Um, so one of the key things here is increased latency sensitivity for, or decreased latency for latency sensitive applications such as voice and gaming. They're using a lot of technologies that make voice over your cell phone work to Wi-Fi, which is why oftentimes you don't run into that many problems when using your cell phone like you do tend to do when you're using voice over Wi-Fi. So one of the things that we do here is something called downlink and uplink MooMimo. So with 802.11 AC Wave 2 equipment, if you were lucky enough to have the right client devices, you could do something um, called downlink MooMimo, which allowed your access point to send data simultaneously to multiple clients. Um, so that's a good thing, right? You, now, instead of each device having to take turns to talk, um, at least on the listening side of things, you can have your access point talk to multiple devices at once. 802.11ax improves how that works and also adds the ability now for multiple client devices to send data at the same time back to the access point. So now you can have multiple people talking on their phones over Wi-Fi and having it simultaneously transmit data from multiple people at the same time to that access point. Another really nice new technology is OFDMA. Um, basically, it allows us to partition segments of the RF spectrum that we're currently using and optimize what's being used based on the individual application. So it'll know how much available bandwidth is needed for a VoIP call, how much is needed for the guy who's downloading uh, files off the shared file server, and how much is needed for the person watching YouTube, and help allocate those across multiple users. So again, allowing multiple users to transmit at the same time, uh, or receive data at the same time, and intelligently allocating that bandwidth so it's optimized for each individual user. The net result of that, again, is tends to be less uh, latency and less risk of drop packets. So MooMimo is using spatial streams to send different bits of data to different users. OFDMA is about, um, is about allocating different channels for different client devices based on the individual application makes a big difference when it comes to latency. So we've got some other technologies here. I won't really get into them, but basically there's a bunch of new technology here um, which makes it easier for you to uh, avoid co-channel interference. Basically, um, as, as it is now, if you're doing, you know, you've got a big office building, you're setting up the Wi-Fi in one office, 
Um, you can manage that, you can control which channels, which access points are using, how much power each access point uses, but you have no control over your neighbors and what your neighbors are doing on those same channels for their Wi-Fi. So automatic cell management gives 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 devices the ability to essentially work with each other in different networks to make sure that this, the the, the channel utilization is optimized. So basically allows your, you and your neighbor's network to be able to sort of work with each other to reduce interference between them without needing to have access to each other's networks. So one of the things here is called a BSS color code. So it's a little bit of an identifier that's automatically applied to the packets that allows the access point or the client device when it sees some data coming in to go, wait a minute, is this for me? Or is this something I should ignore? Um, the other thing we have here is something called dynamic sensitivity control. Basically, the devices can use that BSS color code information to figure out how strong the signal should be from the devices it wants to talk to. So it can change its sensitivity level to ignore stuff that's coming in from the office or the home next door that's using the same channel. And then we have the ability to automatically optimize the power output to maximize the speed of the data connection while also decreasing how far the signal goes to cause interference to other nearby access points or devices. And lastly, we have something called target wait time. With current 802.11 devices, um, as I said, we, they have to take turns as to who broadcasts when. There is no management of that. So what happens is the device listens if it sees somebody else is transmitting, it then uses a random number generator to determine how long it's going to wait, and then it'll check again. Um, and you often end up in situations where you end up waiting much longer than you needed to. Or if you've got a lot of different client devices out there doing some sort of stream, such as VoIP, you end up in a situation where two devices will listen at the same time, say, hey, no one else is talking, and both decide to transmit, thereby interfering with each other. So with target wake time, um, it allows the access point to basically tell the client devices, okay, this is your turn, your turn's coming up. Um, it, so what that does for us is it prevents the, the problem of two or more devices deciding to transmit at the same time. It also makes sure that those wait times are optimized. So each device isn't waiting longer than it needs to before it transmits the data, thereby reducing latency. So those are the main things that are going to be helping you when it comes to uh, VoIP and improving the quality of VoIP. Um, it should make a huge difference. Um, some other cool features that Wi-Fi 6 brings um, is the addition of WPA3. So if you've got your network set up to use WPA3, even if just using a pre-shared key or the pre-shared key or doing nothing, you'll see a bunch of benefits. So for instance, even if you don't have a password to get on your network, with WPA3 and Wi-Fi 6, pretty much all data packets are going to be encrypted. So even without a password, data being transmitted is encrypted, reduces the chances of somebody being able to eavesdrop on the conversation and gather data. It also um, helps prevent um, a number of different Wi-Fi attacks, such as spoofing the access point or spoofing the client and forcing devices to disconnect. So a big benefit when it comes to security, especially in guest networks, which usually are not password protected. Um, if you are using a password, they've optimized or improved the way that the handshaking process is done to reduce the ability for somebody to crack that key. And if you're using 8021X for authentication, um, we've increased security up to 192 bit encryption. So I do want to talk here a little bit about some of the challenges with Wi-Fi 6, some of the things you should be aware of. So we've got two sort of funky things going on. You've got what's called Wi-Fi 6, and you can have devices that are Wi-Fi 6 certified. These started doing this last year. But the actual official 802.11 standard that Wi-Fi 6 is based on isn't expected to be ratified until 2020. And it keeps getting delayed. I've had to update this slide multiple times just in the last couple months because they keep changing the dates of when they're planning to do the ratification. So the question becomes, well, how is that possible? If the standard's not ratified, how do you get certified as being Wi-Fi 6 compliant? Um, and the short answer is 
the the standard itself is close enough to finish now we're just dealing on the nitty-gritty um, details so there's enough known that the chipset vendors are able to make hardware that's going to support all of those features um, and if little minor things change during the final year of ratification uh, it should be able to be compensated for and fixed with software updates to the chip so it'll, it'll just be a firmware update um, if anything significantly changes and the Wi-Fi group itself is going through there and they're trying to fill in some of the blanks and ensure compatibility between multiple devices. So just be aware of that. It, it does get confusing because one of your customers may, you know, say, oh, wait a minute, I thought that hasn't been ratified yet. Um, so just so you're aware of what's going on there. The other big problem you're going to run into is everybody and their sister is running out there to try to market their product as Wi-Fi 6. We had companies launching product a year ago claiming to be Wi-Fi 6 compatible. Um, so basically anything that launched probably before August of this year um, that calls itself Wi-Fi 6 is, going, is not truly Wi-Fi 6. It's kind of like how AT&T um, in the rush to call their product 5G just rebranded part of LTE as 5G with the letter E afterwards, 5GE, um, to confuse the market. It's the same sort of thing here. There's a number of the significant improvements in Wi-Fi 6 that are not going to be supported in the earlier generation chips, whether it's Broadcom or Qualcomm based. So just for comparison here, I've got the Qualcomm Gen 1 and the Qualcomm Gen 2. So you'll see here the Uplink OFDMA, not supported in Gen 1, never will be supported. Um, Uplink MIMO, not supported, never will be supported. Um, the timed wake, never going to be supported. BSS coloring, never going to be supported. So these are some pretty significant improvements over the standard 802.11ax or AC that will never be supported in those Gen 1 chipsets. And it's a similar comparison with the Broadcom Gen 1 and Gen 1.2 chipsets. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is you wanna make sure that any product that you're buying, especially if you're doing VoIP and you're gonna benefit from a lot of these features um, significantly, you wanna make sure you're using newer hardware. So our, our access points are using the, all of our 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 access points that we'll be coming out with here all of those are using the Gen 2 chipsets. All of them support all of the Wi-Fi 6 features. Um, and when it comes to our competitors, the general rule is anything launched probably after August, you're good for. Anything that came out before August, including like the Ingenious APs that came out in July, they're based on the older Gen 1 chipsets. They're not gonna work for you. And that's simply because the chips weren't really available until the end of August um, and for us until October. Um, so just be aware of that when you're, when you're shopping here because it will get confusing. Also, when it comes to Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6 is a lot faster. So what you're going to see is a lot of the Wi-Fi 6 access points are going to require a 2.5, 5 gig or 10 gig port simply because the actual Wi-Fi data transfer rates well over a gig. Um, so expect to see more demand or more need for multi-gig switches going forward rather than your standard one gig switches. Um, also on the higher end Wi-Fi 6 access points, you will need that new 802.3 BT standard, which provides power up to 60 watts instead of 30 watts. A lot of those APs are gonna require that to get full performance. Um, some devices like our first model of uh, Wi-Fi 6 AP these still will work with 802.3 ATPOE, but it will be at a slower speed. So if you're looking to maximize performance, you will need 802.3 BT support. Um, and then client devices themselves, they are going to need to themselves be Wi-Fi 6 chipset based to see most of the benefits. There may be a little bit of benefit um, to some of your older 11N or 11AC devices, but for the most part, to see the benefits of this network, you do need Wi-Fi 6 client devices. And the more of your client devices on those networks that are Wi-Fi 6, the better it's going to perform. Um, older devices will force some of the features into compatibility mode, so it will degrade performance even on some of those Wi-Fi 6 devices in some cases. 
And then last and not least, if you are not part of our reseller partner program, please join. Simply go to our website, fill out a short form. Um, as a next gen member, um, you automatically get gold status. So you automatically get a 20% discount for all Zycel products purchased through distribution. Um, our products are available through DNH, Ingram Micro, Cynix, Wave, and Target distribution. Um, and again, once you get set up in our partner program, you provide us your account information at, each, at your distributor, and you will automatically get your discount applied to any Zycel product you purchase. No need to fill out a uh, deal registration, no need to request a spa, everything will automatically get an additional discount above and beyond your normal distribution discount. So that concludes today's presentation. Um, so if there's any questions, send them in with Q&A box here and I'll answer them for you. So far I don't see any. Um, otherwise, I thank everybody for turning out today. Um, I hope this was beneficial for you. And as always, if you have any feedback or any information you want to provide to us, you can reach out to me directly. I'm Sean, uh, Sean R, S-H-A-W-N-R at Zycel.com. Or reach out to whoever your salesperson is, Sandy, Jeff, Jacob, Ivan, um, and let them know, you know. Did you like today's webinar? Did you not? Is there some things you'd like to see done differently in the future that would make them more valuable for you to join? Um, give us that feedback. Let us know. We also do a number of webinars, usually uh, one or two a week on various different topics every month. Um, everything from best practices to product introductions to um, application scenarios. So again, let us know what sort of information you'd like to see that would make your life easier. Um, and we'll see if we can put together a presentation and webinar for you. We need your suggestions to know what you actually find valuable. And I am not getting any more, any questions in. So if you were writing a question, highlight it, copy it, and email it to me. I'm going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Thanks, everybody.